Hi, so I'm going to talk today about a, a fun rewrite I did of, uh, of the Bindat package. I call this uh, Turbo Bindat, actually the package hasn't changed name, it's just that the result happens to be faster. The point was not to make it faster though, and the point was not to make you understand that data is not code, it's just, it's just one more experience I've had uh, where I've, I've seen that treating data as code is, is not always a, a good idea. It's, in, it's important to keep the difference. So let's get started. So what is Bindat anyway? So here's just the, the overview of basically what I'm going to present. So I'm first going to present you know, Bindat itself for those who don't know it, which is probably the majority of you. And then I'm going to talk about the actual problems that I encountered with this, um, this package that motivated me to rewrite it. And most of them were lack of flexibility and uh, some of it was just you know, poor behavior uh, with respect to, to, to scoping and variables, which of course you know, is, is, is bad, basically uses of, of eval or you know, eval is, is evil. Um, then, then I'm going to talk about the, the new design you know, how, how I redesigned it uh, to make it both simpler and more flexible, and where the, the key idea was to expose code as code instead of having it as, as data. And so here the, the distinction between the two is, is, is important and made things simpler. Uh, I tried to keep efficiency in mind, which was part of the, which part of, uh, resulted in, in some of the, the aspects of the design which are not completely satisfactory. But so the result is actually fairly efficient, even though it was not the main motivation, uh, it, it was uh, one of the nice outcomes. And then I'm going to present some examples. So first, what is Bindat? Oh, actually, rather than present this, I'm going to go straight to the code because Bindat actually had an introduction which was fairly legible. So. Here we go. This is the old Bindat from Emacs 27. And the commentary starts by explaining what is Bindat. So basically Bindat is a package that lets you parse and unparse uh, uh, basically binary data. The intent is to have typically you know, network data or something like this. So assuming you have data, network data uh, presented or defined with some kind of you know, C style structs typically or something along these lines. So you, you know, you presume we'll start with documentation that presents something like those structs here. And you want to be able to generate such package packets and read such packets. And so the way you do it is you rewrite those specifications into the Bindat syntax. So here's the Bindat syntax for the, the previous specification. So here, for example, you see the case for a data package uh, uh, data packet, sorry, which will have uh, you know a type field, which is a byte, you know an unsigned eight-bit uh, entity, then an opcode, which is also a byte, then a length, which is a sixteen-bit unsigned integer in in uh, little endian order, and then some ID for for this entry, which is eight bytes containing a, a zero terminated string. And then the actual data, you know, the, basically the payload, which has to be, a, which is in this case a vector of bytes. The bytes here doesn't doesn't need to be specified. And here we spe specify the length of this vector. And this length here happens to be actually the name of this field. So the length of the data is specified by the length field here. And Bindat will understand this part, which is the the nice part of of, of, of Bindat. And then you have an alignment field at the end, which basically is padding. Uh, it says that I, it, it is padded until the next multiple of four. Okay, so this works reasonably well. This is actually fairly nice. With this, you can then uh, call bin dot pack or bin dot unpack, passing it a string or passing it uh, an, an, an a list to to do the the packing and unpacking. So, for example, if you take this string, actually in this case it's a, it's a vector of bytes, but it works, it works the same, it works in both ways. If you pass this to bindat unpack, it will presumably will return you, you know, this structure if you've given it the, 
the corresponding type. So it will extract, you know, that it will see that, oh, there was an IP address for, for, which was a destination IP, a source IP, and some port number and some actual d data here and there, etc. So, you know, this is quite convenient if you, if you need to do this. And that's what it was designed for. Um, so here we are. Let's go back to the actual talk. So I I was uh, I, I converted Bindat to lexical scoping at some point, and things seemed to work fine, except at some point, if, uh, 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 probably weeks later, I got a I saw a, a bug report about about the, the new the new uh, pack the new version using lexical scoping not working correctly with uh, with wechat so here is the actual chunk of codes that appears in in wechat so here you see that they also define uh, a bin that spec uh, so it's it's a packet that has a, a 32 bit unsigned length then some compression byte compression information, then uh, an ID, which contains basically another struct, which is specified elsewhere, it doesn't matter here. And after that, a vector whose size is, is not just specified by length, but is computed from length. So here's how they used to compute it in WeChat. So the length here can be specified in, in BeanDat instead of having just a reference to one of the fields or having a constant, you can actually compute it where you have to, to, to use this parentheses eval and then you followed by the actual expression where you say how, how you compute it. And here, you know, you, you see that it actually computes it based on the length of the struct. So that's supposed to be this length field here. And it's referred to using the bin.get field to extract the field from the variable struct. And then it, it, it subtracts four, it subtracts one, and adds some other things, which is uh, which depends on some field that's found in this ID field here. And the problem with this code was that it it broke because of this struct variable here, because this struct variable is not defined anywhere in the specification of of Bindat. It's it was used internally as a local variable. And because it was using uh, dynamic scoping, it actually happened to be available here, but the documentation nowhere specifies it. So it was not exactly a, a bug of the conversion to lexical scoping, but you know, it ended up breaking this code. And there was no way to actually fix the code within the specification of Bindat. So you had to go outside the specification of Bindat to fix this problem. So this is basically how I started looking at BinDat. Then I, I went to actually investigate a bit more what was going on. And the things I noticed along the way was basically that the specification of BinDat is, is fairly complex and has a lot of eval and things like this. So let's take a look at what BinDat specification looks like. So here it's actually documented as a kind of you know, grammar rules. So you have a specification is basically a sequence of items. And then each of the item is basically a field of, of a struct. So it's, it has a field name and then the type. Uh, instead of a type, it could have some other form for eval, which was basically never used as far as I know. Or it can be some filler, or you can have some this uh, align specification, or you can refer to another struct. It could also be some kind of union, or it can be some kind of repetition of something. And then you have the type specified here, which can be a, 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 some integers or strings or a vector. And there are a few other spe special cases. And then you have you know, the actual field itself can be either name or something that's computed. And then everywhere here you have len, which specifies the length of vectors, for example, or length of strings. This is actually either nil to, to mean one or it can be an arg, where arg is defined to be either an integer, or deref, which deref, where deref is basically a specification that can refer, for example, to the length field. That's what we saw. We saw it's between parentheses, length was this way to refer to the length field. Or it can be 
an expression, which is what we saw in the, the computation of the length for WeChat, where you just had a parentheses eval and then some computation of the length of the of the payload. And so if you look here, you see that it, it is fairly large and, and complex, and it has it uses eval everywhere. And actually, it's not just that it has eval in its syntax, but the implementation has to use eval everywhere because if you go back to see the, the kind of code we see, we see here we just define WeChat relief message spec as a constant. It's nothing than just just data, right? So within this data, there are things we need to evaluate, but it is pure data. So it will have to be evaluated by passing it to eval. It can't be compiled because it's within a quote, right? And so for that reason, Kitten really suffer terribly with, uh, with uses of, of Bindat. You really have to be very careful with that. More seriously, um, the struct variable was not documented, and yet it's indispensable for, for, for importing applications such as using in WeChat. So clearly this needs to be fixed. Of course, we can just document struct as some variable that's used there, but of course, we don't want to do that because struct is, is not obviously a, a dynamically scoped variable, so it's, it's not very, very clean. Also, other problems I noticed was that the grammar is significantly more complex than, than necessary. We have nine distinct non-terminals. There is ambiguity if you try to use uh, if you might try to use a field whose name is align or or fill or or something like this, then it's it's going to be misinterpreted or it can be misinterpreted. Um, the vector length, you know, it can be either an expression or an integer or a reference to a label, but the expression should all already be the general case, and this expression can itself be just a constant integer. So there's there's you know, this complexity is probably not indispensable or it could be replaced with something simpler. That's what I felt like. And basically lots of places allow an eval exp form somewhere to, to open up the door for more flexibility, but not all of them do. And, and we, don't, we don't really want to have this eval there, right? It's not very convenient syntactically either. So it makes the uses of eval a bit heavier than they need to be. And so I didn't really like this part. Another part was that when I tried to, to figure out what was going on, I had uh, I had trouble, trouble, you know, Winnie as well, as you can hear, she had trouble as well. But one of the trouble was, was that I, there was no way to, to debug the code via e-debug, because it's just data, so e-debug doesn't know that it has to, to look at it and, and instrument it. And of course, it was not conveniently extensible. That's also one of the, the things I noticed along the way. Okay, so here's an example of problems not that I didn't just see there, but that, that were actually present in, in code. So I, you know, I went to look at a code that was using Bindat to see what uses looked like. And I saw that Bindat was not used very heavily, but some of the, the main uses was just to read and write uh, integers. And here you can see a, a very typical case where you have, in this is also a case coming from WeChat. We do a bin dat get field of the length of some some struct we, we read, but actually the, the struct we read is here. It has a single field because the only thing we want to do is actually to unpack a 32-bit integer. But the only way we can do that is by specifying a struct with one field. Uh, and so we have to extract this struct of one field, which constructs an A list containing the actual integer, and then we just use get field to extract it. So there's, you know, it doesn't seem very, very elegant to have to construct an alias just to then extract the, the integer from it. Same thing if you try to pack it, you'd first have to, to, to construct the alias to pass it to bin that pack uh, unnecessarily. Another problem I, I saw in this case, it was in the WebSocket package, was was here where they actually have a function where they need to write an integer of a size that, that will vary depending on the circumstances. And so they have to test the value of, of this integer and depending on, on which one it is, they're going to use different types. And so here it's, it's a case where 
we will want to have some kind of way to to eval to e compute the length of the of the integer instead of a, of it having uh, been uh, predefined or, or fixed. Uh, so this is one of the cases where there's you know, the lack of eval was was uh, was a problem. And actually, in in all of uh, of WebSocket, BinBat is only used to pack and unpack integers, even though. There are many more opportunities to use BinDAT bin in there, but it's not very convenient to use BinDAT as it stands for, for, those, for those other cases. So what does the, the, new, the new design look like? Well, in the new design, here is uh, what the, the, the problematic codes uh, for WeChat. So we basically have the same fields as before. You just see that instead of U32, we now have UNT32 separately. The idea is that now this 32 can be an expression you can you can evaluate, and so the U8 is also replaced by U int 8, and the ID type is basically the same as before. And here another difference we see, and the main difference is that uh, actually it's the, the second main difference. The first main difference is that we don't actually quote this this whole thing. Instead, we pass it to the bin that type macro. So this is a macro that will that's going to actually build the type, and this is a big difference in terms of performance also because by making it a macro, we can pre-compute the code that's going to pack and unpack this this thing instead of having to interpret it every time we pack and unpack. So this macro will generate more efficient code along the way. Also, it makes the code that appears in here visible to the to the compiler because we can. Uh, give an e -debug spec for it. And so here, as an argument to VEC, instead of having to specify that this is an evaluated expression, we just write the expression directly, because all the expressions that appear there will just be evaluated. And and we don't need to, to use the struct variable and then extract the length field from it. We can just use length as a variable. So this variable length here will refer to this field here. And then this variable ID here will refer to this field here. And so we can just use the field values as local variables, which is very natural and very efficient also because the code would actually directly do that. And the code that unpacks those data will just you know, extract an integer and bind it to the length variable. And so that, that makes it immediately variable available there. OK, uh, let's see also what uh, what the actual documentation looks like. And so if we, if we look at the doc of, of BINDAT, we, we see the actual specification of the grammar. And so here we see, instead of having these nine different uh, non-terminals, we basically have two. We have the non-terminal for type, which can be either a uint, uint r, or a string, or bits, or fill, or line, or vec, or those various other forms. Or it can be a struct, in which case, you know, in, in the case of struct, then it will be followed by a sequence, you know, a, a list of fields, where each of the fields is basically a label followed by another type. And so this is, you know, this makes the whole specification much simpler. We don't have any distinction now between uh, struct being a special case as, as, as opposed to just the, the normal types. Struct is just now one of the possible types that can appear here. Uh, the other thing is that the label is always pre present in the structure, so there's no amb ambiguity. Also, all the above things like, you know, the bit length we have here, the length we have here, the count for vector we have here, these are all plain ELISP expressions. So they are implicitly evaluated if necessary. And if you want them to be constant, really constant, you can just use quotes for those where cases where it's necessary. Another thing is that you can extend it with uh, with BINDAT def macro. Okay, let's go back here. So what are the advantages of this approach? Uh, as I said, you know, one of the main advantages is that we now have support for e-debug. Uh, we don't have struct, repeat, and align as special cases anymore. These are just normal types. And before there was you int as type, you int as type, and those kinds of things. Struct and repeat and align were in a different, different case. And so you know, there were some subtle differences between those 
that completely disappeared. Also, in the in the special cases, there was union, and union now has completely disappeared. We don't need it anymore because instead we can actually use code anywhere. That's one of the, the things I didn't mention here, but uh, he, in in this uh, in this note here, that's one of the important nodes. Not only bit length, length count, etc., are expressions, but the type itself, you know, any type itself is basically an expression. And so you can actually, instead of having u int bit length, you can have if blah 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 u int otherwise string. And so you can have a, a field that can be either a string or an int depending on on some exp on some condition. And for that reason, we don't need a union. Instead of having a union, we can just have a cond or a p case that will return. The, the type we want to use, depending on, on the context, which will generally depend on some previous uh, previous field. Also, we don't need to use single field structs for, for simple types anymore, because we can just, we don't, you know, there's no distinction between struct and and other types. And so we can pass to bin tab, bin, bin that pack and bin that unpack a specification which just says, here's an integer. And we'll just pack and unpack the integer. And of course, now all the code is exposed. So not only eDebug works, but also FlyMake and the compiler, etc. You know, they, sh they can uh, complain about it and give you warnings and errors uh, as uh, as you like, as we like them. And of course, the kit and other are much happier. Okay. Um, this is going a bit over time, so let's uh, let's try to go faster. Uh, here are some of the, the new features that are introduced. I already mentioned briefly that you can define new types with bindat def macro. That's that's one of the important you know, novelties, and you can extend bindat with new types this way. The other thing you can do is uh, you can control how uh, values are are, are straight or packets are unpacked uh, and and how they they are represented. In, in the old bin that a packet is necessarily represented when you unpack it as uh, as an a list basically you know, a struct becomes an a list and that's that's all there is and you don't have any choice about it with the new system you can by default it also returns just an a list but you can actually control what it is unpacked as or or what it's packed from uh, using the these keywords with unpack val you can give an expression that will construct the unpacked value from from the various uh, fields. And with packval and packvar, you can specify how to extract the information from the unpacked value to to generate the pack value. So here are some examples. Uh, uh, here's an example taken from OSC. Uh, OSC actually doesn't use bindat currently, but I. I, I, I have tried to, to you know, I've played with it to see what it would look like if we were to use bin that. So here it was, uh, here's the definition of the, the time tag representation, which represents timestamps in, uh, in OSC. So it would be, you would use bin that type, and then you have here bin pack var basically gives a name when we try to pack uh, a, a, a timestamp time is going to be the variable whose name contains the actual timestamp we will receive. So we want to represent the unpacked value as a normal Emacs timestamp, and then basically convert from this timestamp to a string or from a string to this timestamp. So when we receive it, well, we'll, it's going to be called time, so we can refer to it. And so in order to actually you know, encode it, we basically turn this timestamp into an integer that's what this pack val does. It says, you know, when we try to pack it, here's the the value that, that we should use. So we turn it into an integer, and then this integer is going to be encoded as a uint 64-bit, so a 64-bit unsigned integer. And when we try to unpack the value, well, this ticks field will, is going to contain an unsigned int of 64-bit, and we want to return instead uh, uh, a timestamp, you know, a, a time value for, for Emacs. 
And here we just rep represent it. We use the, the, the representation of times in, uh, as, as a pair of a number of ticks and, and the, the corresponding frequency of, of those ticks. So that's what we do here with unpack val. We just construct the cons corresponding to it. So this, with this definition, bin that pack and unpack are going to convert to and from proper type va time values on one side and uh, binary strings on the other. Uh, note, of course, that you know I complained that the old bin that had to use you know, single field structs uh, for for simple types, and here basically I'm back using single field structs as well for this particular case, and it's actually a reasonably frequent case to be honest. But uh, at least you know the, this is not so problematic because we actually control what is returned. So even though it's a single string field struct, it's not going to construct an A list or force you to construct an A list. Instead, it, re it really receives and, and takes a value in the ideal representation that we chose. Here we have a, a more complex example where the actual type is recursive because it's represented those LEB. Uh, um, it's called, I can't remember what LEB stands for, but it's a, it's a representation for you know, arbitrary length integers, where basically it's a, every byte is, is either uh, smaller than 20, 128, in which case it's the end of the, of the value, or it's a value bigger than 128, in which case there's an extra byte at the end. And that, that's going to continue. And here we we see the representation is basically a structure that con that starts with a byte, which contains this value, which can be either the last value or not, and the tail, which will either be empty or contain something else. The empty empty is here. If the head if the head value is smaller than 128, then the type of this of this tail is going to be unit zero. So it's basically a, a Unit is, is the empty type, and zero is going to be the value we, we receive when we read it. And and if not, then it's it has as, as type loop, which is the type we're de de defining. So it's it's the recursive case, where then the rest of the type is the type itself. And so this lets us pack and unpack. We pass it an, an arbitrary size integer, and it's, it's going to to turn it into this LEB128 uh, binary representation and vice versa. I have uh, other exp ex examples if you want to, if you're interested. But anyway, so here's the conclusion. Uh, we have a, a simpler, more flexible and more powerful uh, bin that now, which is also significantly faster. And I can't remember the exact uh, uh, speed up, but it's definitely not a few percents I vaguely remember about four times faster in my tests, but it's probably very different in, in different cases. Uh, so it, it might be just four times, two times, you know, who knows. Uh, try it for, for yourself, but I was pretty pleased because it was not the main motivation. And so, so anyway, the negatives are here. Um, in the new system, there's this bin that def macro, which lets us define kind of new types. And bin that, bin that type also lets us define new types, and the distinction between the two is a bit a, a bit subtle. It uh, kind of depends on you know what's it. It has an impact on efficiency more more than anything, so it's not very satisfactory. There's a bit of redundancy between the two. Uh, there is no bit level control, just as before. We can only manipulate basically bytes, so this is definitely not usable for like a Huffman encoding kind of thing. Um, also, it's not nearly as flexible as some some of the alternatives. So, uh, you know, GNU poke is uh, has been a uh, a vague uh, inspiration for for this work, and GNU poke gives gives you a lot more power in how to specify the types, etc. And of course, one of the main downside is that it's still not used very much. Actually, a new bin that is not used by any package as far as I know right now. But even the old one is not used very often. So. Uh, who knows whether it's going, actually going to, to work very much better or, or not. Anyway, this is it for, for this talk. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.